Everyone wants to feel smart. We want to feel smart so bad that we invent different kinds of smart so that you can be that kind of smart when you're clearly not the other kind of smart. Get what we're saying? One of the best ways to feel smart is to like smart things or smart people. Rick Sanchez of Rick and Morty is the smartest man in the multiverse. Just ask him, he'll tell you. Not only that, but Rick C-137 is the rickest Rick of the central finite curve, meaning out of all the smart Ricks, he is the smartest. Which of course means that in order to be a fan of Rick and Morty, you have to be pretty smart, R right? That's how it works, isn't it? There are a lot of cartoons, shows, comic books, movies, and more that center around square-jawed, hard-punching heroes. People with broad shoulders and bald fists that have never met a problem they can't punch. It's an attractive fantasy to be so powerful that nothing dares stand in your way. But then superhero movies started coming out and we got to hear how hard it was to look just like a superhero. That's a lot of work and even then you still need a stunt double and coordinator to pull the whole thing off. What a drag. Even worse, the hard punching bad guy smashing story is a bit of a common denominator. Everyone can get into those kinds of stories, they're easy to understand, even if there is subtlety, you don't need it. Smart stuff, however, well, smart stuff only smart people get. There have been a few stories about smart people. The Marvel Universe is mostly scientists who have given themselves superpowers somehow, but those still end up as punchy kicky types. Then there's the characters like Rick Sanchez of Rick and Morty. Rick has two powers, being super smart and having no attachment to anything. With those two things, he's able to skip across the multiverse with his portal gun and go on endless adventures as long as he has his trusty, not-so-smart Morty with him to disguise his super genius brainwaves. So naturally, you'd have to be pretty smart to follow the adventures of someone as smart as Rick, right? In fact, if you don't like Rick and Morty, it's because you can't comprehend its intellectual heights. If you don't have a grasp of theoretical physics, how can you possibly grasp the subtle nuances of characters like Mr. Pooby Butthole or the sly commentary of the show within a show Ball Fondlers? This obsession is not restricted to a show like Rick and Morty. Shows like Frasier, which centers around a self-described smart character, has the same effect of attracting people who want to feel smart by watching Frasier. Even though in the show Big Bang Theory being smart is the joke, the show did have a fan base that reveled in catching any of the science or geek references made in the show to demonstrate the smartness of the characters. And this is despite the show always intending for smartness to be the butt of the joke. In test screenings of their original pilot, where the Penny character was much meaner to the show's central science geniuses, they were surprised that the audience was so protective of the nerds. Aaron Sorkin has built a career around assuring his audience feels smart by liking his stories. It's not just angry young people on the internet that like to have their entertainment tell them they're smart. But how smart is it? How does a community college dropout and a former reality show associate producer manage to make a show that requires a primer in theoretical physics and early 20th century revolutionary Russian philosophy? Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland might not have degrees in theoretical physics or political philosophy, but one thing they do have is a pretty good understanding of story. And Dan Harmon got that understanding of story from a pretty smart guy named Joseph Campbell. That name should sound familiar to a lot of fans of modern science fiction because he's influenced a lot of it, not the least of which is Star Wars. George Lucas used the archetypes of the monomyth, that is the shared elements in all heroic myths, to create his epic series. Likewise, Dan Harmon has distilled the hero's journey into what he calls the story circle. From Harmon's circle, there are eight steps. The hero is in the state of comfort, but they want something. They enter an unfamiliar situation and adapt to it, getting what they want. That comes at a terrible price, returning them to their familiar situation having changed. It's a simplified version of Campbell's breakdown that has 17 steps with exotic names like Atonement for the Father and Meeting with the Goddess. What this means, though, is that Harmon has studied and applied the monomyth and applies it to everything he writes. This allows him to write a story that can be at once wholly surprising and completely familiar. We are adjusted to these kinds of stories because they are the stories that have been a part of the culture since we started telling stories. In fact, Harmon's adherence to the story circle is exactly the kind of thing that allows him to tell weirder and weirder stories. Because no matter how strange, they're grounded in a structure that we can all recognize. Another way that Rick and Morty fosters familiarity is another big hallmark of its creators. Justin Roiland became popular with the Channel 101 crowd with pop culture riffs like House of Cosby's and the show that started Rick and Morty, The New Adventures of Doc and Marty, an overt troll of Back to the Future as a reaction to the cease and desist notes they got after House of Cosby's. 
Dan Harmon's cult hit sitcom Community was riddled with pop culture references with the character of Abed acting as the meta-referential explanation to the rest of the characters. In essence, Abed was portrayed as deluded in the narrative of the show, but in fact he was the only character that knew on some level that they were all on a television show and therefore operating on sitcom rules rather than real-world rules where a community college wouldn't fall into chaos every year over a paintball game. Pretty clever, right? Like another science fiction parody cartoon Futurama, Rick and Morty make use of numerous science fiction references. But while Futurama might be a sip from the fountain of sci-fi references, such as doing an episode that's a parody of Starship Troopers, Rick and Morty is like taking a fire hose of sci-fi references to the face. Even the second episode where Rick and Morty enter the dreams of Morty's math teacher. The overall premise is to take on Inception, a movie that Dan Harmon has been critical of on his podcast Harmon Town. As the characters dive deeper and deeper into Mr. Goldenfold's dream levels, they end up in a parody of The Nightmare on Elm Street, being chased by Scary Terry. Going into Scary Terry's dreams, they find out that Terry is tormented by a cruel teacher. During all of that, there's a whole other story where the Smith's family dog is given intelligence and starts a dog revolution, making references to everything from Lawnmower Man to Animal Farm. And here's the thing, you don't have to get all those references to feel like you get the episode. You'll still get most of the jokes of the episode. But the more references you get, the more clever you'll feel. The biggest problem with writing a character who is a genius is that if the person who is writing is in fact not a genius, it's hard to create one. And if they are a genius, how do you make a genius character make sense to people who aren't themselves geniuses? While well, science figures like Stephen Hawking, Carl Sagan, and Neil deGrasse Tyson have all managed to do some incredibly smart things. Most of what makes them well known outside of circles of scientists is their ability to explain complicated scientific concepts to people who don't have a physics background. Rick and Morty trades on this idea. Part of that is using recognizable advanced physics. Some of these have reached the popular consciousness, so even laymen know that there was a man named Schrodinger who theorized about a cat in a box and a vial of poison who is both dead and alive until the box is open to determine which. That's all you need to get that joke about Schrodinger's cat. You don't have to know that Schrodinger created the thought experiment to demonstrate the silly nature of the newly understood quantum states by creating a cat that was a both alive and a not alive. As it turns out, if you have a deep science background, you'll find out that a lot of science is wrong on the show because the science part serves the fiction part. In so-called hard sci-fi, the science is supposed to be grounded. Rick and Morty is not hard sci-fi. If you're not a DeGrasse Tyson or Sagan, then there's another way to go about making a genius character feel like a genius, and that technique goes back at least as far as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is perhaps the most famous of the genius characters and has what is the most prototypical methods of introducing his genius when he Sherlocks his clients. Holmes will make a series of observations about his new acquaintance, running down where their accessories or clothing are worn out, what mud is on their shoe, or what hand they adjust their glasses. These kinds of reads are amazing, but less amazing when you realize that Holmes is right because the person writing his lines is also writing the story. Holmes is right because Doyle needs him to be right in order to be a genius. The same thing happens in Rick and Morty. Rick makes a prediction as a genius or tells the less than genius characters how a thing works and lo and behold, Rick's predictions come true. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a genius. But even more so than Sherlock Holmes, Rick lives in a completely made up world that only has to behave exactly how Rick says it will. But here's where the show gets actually particularly clever. Rick's central thesis is that being smart isolates you since there are an infinite number of parallel worlds and your life is finite and fleeting. Nothing particular matters, and connections with people are a means to an end. This is the takeaway that has caused much hand-wringing about the influence of the show, that Rick has created a sea of self-described smart people who feel like they've been vindicated in their lack of connection to the social niceties of the normie world, causing them to have embarrassing meltdowns in McDonald's trying to get a promotional dipping sauce from the 90s. But that read of Rick isn't very deep. Performatively, Rick is often the hero of the story. He's the funny one, he's the one who controls the story and reacts and moves the story along. However, more often than not, narratively Rick is often wrong. Not how the world works or any of his science projects. Well, except when he tried to cure having Cronenberg the world, but his philosophy doesn't actually get vindicated in the end. But it's often not Rick's intelligence that isolates, but his narcissism, and his narcissism becomes a self-feeding cycle of loneliness that Rick tries to recontextualize, but often in moments alone hits him. He becomes willing to sacrifice himself to save Morty, when Morty and Summer split time, despite it also being the episode where he used math to explain how little his grandchildren mean to him. As much as Morty becomes wearily resolved to Rick's worldview, Rick is equally, if not more so, influenced by Morty's empathy. Ooh-wee, that's some deep stuff! Good job, CBR!
And that's why you have to be smart to enjoy Rick and Morty. But not really. What do you think? Is it the science or philosophy that makes Rick and Morty? Or is it the characters like Mr. Booby Butthole and fourth dimensional testicle creatures that make the show? Or should people just relax and enjoy things without thinking it makes you smart or stupid? Let us know in the comments and while you're at it, why not hit the subscribe button? It'd be the smart thing to do for the latest videos in your inbox.